The risen Lord be with you. And so with you. Welcome to our service this morning. Let us join in the responsive call to worship. Today, waiting in joy. What are you waiting for? And joy on the upright in heart. Rejoice in the Lord, you who are righteous, and praise his holy name. Where is your joy? Sing for joy to God our strength. Shout aloud to the God of Jacob. Amen.
hearts for prayer. Let us join our voices together in the prayer of approach and prayer of confession. God of light and love, we rejoice in your presence this day, for you look kindly on us, no matter how we came to be here. You bring order from chaos and call for justice for the vulnerable. You turn weeping into laughter, promising life made new. You redeem all that appears lost, giving each one a path and purpose. And so we come to you in joy, trusting you to bring peace and hope into these uncertain times. Receive our worship this day as we anticipate the difference your gifts will make to us through Christ, your Son, and Savior. Generous God, we confess that our concerns are narrow, focused mostly on our own lives. Opportunities to say thanks or to offer encouragement slip by. Anxiety turns inward, and anger can make us slash out. Forgive us for neglecting the joy at the heart of the Advent season. Turn our hearts back to you and inspire us with your love made flesh in Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. In Jesus Christ, we are a part of God's new creation. God love, God loves, love makes us do, makes all things new. Know that you are forgiven by this great love. Now find the courage to, to forgive yourself and one another. In Jesus' name. Amen. Abigail and Evelyn are here today. If they would like to join me up here for a minute. Oh, would you bring a Bible with you? A Bible and a huge ring. We'll just sit over here this morning just so you see that. Before we start, I want to show you this. Remember this quote? I've never seen this before. Yeah, and we all tied up. Take it out of the bag again. The one that you tied. Yeah, it's the one that you tied. Um, all the members of the congregation, I believe, I hope, had an opportunity to tie a knot in this beautiful quilt. Uh, today, I have a lot of wrap it now that we've nicely folded it up. So today, this quilt, do you remember the story behind the quilt where it's going? Minecraft, yes. And, and there's a little boy who loves Minecraft. And do you remember his story? Okay. So he has cancer, and he hasn't been able to go to school now for um, the whole year. And uh, so today, uh, we're going to be presenting this quilt to his grandpa. And his grandpa's going to take it home to him. Uh, and it's from us from the congregation, letting them know that we're thinking about it. And each knot that is tied here, a prayer was said for him. So he's going to know that when he wraps himself in this quilt that he has been prayed for many times over. And every time he, he picks it up or wraps himself in it, he'll remember that he's got a family who love him and care for him in his church. And he's hoping in, in February, if all goes well, that he'll be able to get back to church in Newburgh again. And the lady who made it is the very talented. She made it a pillow case as well in Minecraft. Nelson. Mm -hmm. And look here. This is a, a little monkey. And he's got Minecraft pants on. So we'll present them to his grandma today. And he'll take them home and give them to Robert for Christmas. Okay. Well, thank you again, Nelson. We wanted to uh, have that on the video today recorded. So you got your Bibles. And uh, has anything changed up here since last week? No. Yeah. <laughs> Which is it? Um, the sheep. The sheep? And the uh, um, guy. And the, the sheep and the guy? Yeah, and uh, he changed. He was over there before and I was over there. He switched around? Yeah. Okay. Somebody switched. Uh, Somebody switched? So what's new? what is new? So, so uh, was this guy here last week? No. Okay, so who is he? Who is he? Shepherd. And uh, what's a shepherd do? Um, um, he takes care of the sheep. Takes care of the sheep. 
Okay. And flour. All right, what, what do you think he does to help him take care of him? What, what would be some of his jobs? Feed them? Um, they, they take them like, on a journey to walk around. Where they can find food? And what else do they need to survive besides food? Water. Water, right. And then maybe at night bring them all together to keep them safe from wolves or coyotes. And what does he have in his arms then? A baby sheep. A baby sheep. And just to um, tie that in, in our passage today upstairs, it's Isaiah 40. And the words in Isaiah 40 are this. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will carry the lambs in his arms, holding them close to his heart. He will gently lead the mother's sheep with their milk. And there's the shepherd holding the baby in his arms, like God holds us sometimes when we, we, we need his comfort and care. He pulls us close. He pulls us, takes care of us. So that's what the shepherd does. He looks after his flock. And who's over here? Um, Mary and Joseph. Okay. And we have the donkey and the cow, like last week, and the sheep. Okay, so what's missing? The baby. The baby who? Baby Jesus. Okay, very good. Now, just very quickly, I want just to have you know today where you can read the Christmas story in the Bible. So, remember the two parts of the, of the Bible, the main two parts of the Bible? There's the Old Testament and the... New. New Testament. So we need to go to the New Testament because the New Testament is where the story of Jesus begins. He's promised in the Old Testament and then he comes in the New Testament. And that's the Gospels are about the birth of Jesus and, and what his life on earth is about. Okay, so we go way uh, past the middle of the Bible to find the New Testament. Okay. So Matthew's the first chapter, the first book. You see the numbers of it small again. See if they get big, and then they get small again. 800, 900, and then they see they're, they're small again. So we want Luke. We want to go to Luke, which is what you have. And you've got Matthew. So the New Testament begins with Matthew, followed by Mark, followed by Luke. Okay? And if you go to have Luke 2, You'll see a title that might be of interest to you. Um, let's see what's it say. So there's the, the birth of Jesus, the shepherds and the angels, Jesus is named. So that's all about the birth of Jesus. So when you have a bit of time, maybe later today, sometime this week, begin to read that story. That's where the story of the birth of Jesus in Luke chapter 2. Okay? We want to read it all today. But you're, you're helping me tell the story, and you're able to see pictures of it here as well as you read it. All right? All right, you can close your Bibles now. Let's join our voices together in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And our carol we're going to sing today, What Child Is This? Do you know what child it is? We know what child it is, don't we? What's the name of the child? Gross? What's the name of the child? That's it.
found in Isaiah chapter 40, verses 1 to 11. Words of hope. Comfort my people, says our God. Comfort them. Encourage the people of Jerusalem. Tell them they have suffered long enough. And their sins are now forgiven. I have punished them in full for all of their sins. A voice cries out. Prepare in the wilderness a road for the Lord. Clear the way in the desert for our God. Fill every valley. Level every mountain. The hills will become a plain, and rough country will be made smooth. Then the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all mankind will see it. The Lord himself has promised this. A voice cries out, Proclaim the message. What message shall I proclaim, I ask? Proclaim that all mankind are like grass. They last no longer than wild flowers. Grass withers and flowers fade when the Lord sends the wind blowing over them. People are no more enduring than grass. Yes, grass withers and flowers fade, but the word of our God endures forever. Jerusalem, go up on a high mountain, tell that the God is coming, and proclaim the good news. Call out with a loud voice, Zion, announce the good news. Speak out and do not be afraid. Tell the towns of Judah that their God is coming. The sovereign Lord is coming to rule with power, bringing with him the power bringing with him the people he has rescued. He will take care of his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs together and carry them in his arms. He will gently lead their mothers. And so ends the reading of this scripture. God of wisdom, shine the light of your truth on us as we've heard your word speaking in the scriptures. Open our hearts to receive that word which can change our minds and our lives through the grace of Jesus Christ, your living word. Speak to us now at this time. Steady our, our, our minds and free us from all the things that we're thinking of and that are pulling us, that make us anxious. And may our, this time focus on you and you alone. May these words Prepare to be a blessing and speak your truth and love. In Christ we pray. Amen. We're journeying with the prophet Isaiah today as he points us to the coming Christ in this Advent season. His first words, comfort, comfort my people. What does comfort look like? What does it taste like? What does it, what does it feel like to you? To understand these words, I want to just sort of paint a little picture of what's going on at the time these words were spoken. We need to understand the comfort Isaiah's original audience he was speaking to. 587 BC, Jerusalem was conquered and destroyed by the Babylonian Empire. The leaders and a large chunk of the people were marched off to Babylon. The prophets made it unmistakably clear that the destruction of the city and the exile to Babylon was not because of Babylon's superior military strength. They were a well -deserved, it was a well-deserved punishment from God. Chapter after chapter then describes how the people of Jerusalem prospered through wickedness, oppression, lies, and social injustice refusing to heed the prophet's calls to repent and be reconciled to God. The kingdom was gone. The temple, the very house of God, was in ruins, enslaved and exiled. Israel was under the power of forces they could never hope to defeat. They did not see any possible relief from the consequences of their sin. Isaiah wrote to a wounded and broken people. God sent them a message of comfort and hope when all hope seemed lost. After he gave the bad news, he then proclaimed the good news. What is that good news? The 
first point of comfort to highlight this is what the wounded and broken people need to hear most was that God called them my people, my people. Comfort. Comfort, he wants to comfort his people now. Comfort can be defined as a, a relational, uh, coming alongside to sort of fortify, to strengthen, to, to build up, to point to a better time, and to have that feeling of, of someone maybe putting their, their arm around us, or you know, offering us a, a refreshment. When we, we visit in a home, a friend, we often offered uh, a refreshment. It just, it's a way of comforting us and making us feel welcome. What were some of your comforts growing up? Uh, many children, you know, kind of suck their thumb as a, as a form of comfort, or a favorite blanket, or a favorite stuffy, uh, or your little arms around your, your parents' leg, you know, or, or an embrace by your parents. As adults, we find comfort in, in different things. That mm, lazy boy recliner is pretty good, <laughs> or even that cruise is pretty comforting. <laughs> or a glass of something tasty, or a place of familiarity that offers comfort. And we have now terms for comfort. We have comfort food. A bag of chips, that mashed potatoes and meatloaf are pretty comforting. We refer to having comfy clothing. Oh, those favorite jeans, or those uh, baggy shirt, or those track pants, pretty comforting. And we have comfortable scenes that just seem to create a certain sense of ah for us. Comfort. Comfort connects us to all that is warm and satisfying. Consequently, we don't usually connect the idea of comfort to strength and power. Comfort is, is putting your feet up after a hard day's work, maybe sipping a little glass of wine, enjoying the crackling fire on the earth. Comfort. Comfort, we think, is sort of a soft and gentle concept. It, it's not a working word. However, the Latin, the English word comfort is a combination of the Latin words comfortus, or with strength. <coughs> So the theological concept of comfort is likewise vigorous. In the Heidelberg Catechism, its opening question is this. What is your only comfort in life and death? It is placed there because in the theological tradition, comfort is a word with muscle. Before it is some tender and cozy sigh of relief, comfort comes first as a, as a bracing, in-your-face message about what, what is what in life. In other words, we're discomforted or out of our, our depth, made on easy, feeling out of place before we can experience the depth of comfort that we seek. But if ever true comfort is going to come to us all, it needs to begin by addressing what is wrong. And this 40th chapter of Isaiah is well known as a comfort passage. But it is really saying the same thing here. There's a, a whole period in Isaiah that is the verses of our starkness. And then along comes the promise of comfort. Obviously, the comfort Isaiah is commanded to proclaim is so valuable because the people have suffered long. Along with that, the second verse makes clear that the source of their suffering had been their own sinfulness. Comfort comes not to those who deserve a reward, but instead to those who have already felt the pain and the sting of their transgressions and where that can lead them. The rest of the passage also conveys the link between getting serious about the jagged edges of our lives and the true comfort that emerges from that. Doing the, the heavy lifting of work, of, of discerning what, what is wrong and trying to make things 
right, and then comfort emerges from that. Verse 3, a voice cries out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight the desert at a highway for our God. Do you hear? The way of the Lord begins smack in the middle of the desert. God comes to us where we are, even in the depth and darkness and, and darkness of the wilderness. It is in the wilderness, that biblical, that biblical location of evil, that God begins to construct his highway of peace. If the salvation of God is strong to emerge from anywhere, it will be from the middle of, of life's nastiness. The passage goes on to say that we need God to be the one who will lead us out of the wilderness because on our own, we cannot do it. We are fragile. We need God to lead us. If we wish to access the comfort Isaiah is declaring here, we begin by recognizing and acknowledging all that is sort of thorny and ugly about life and about life and our own hearts. We need to claim it, we need to make it visible and real, and then we begin the work of, of clearing the way. We need to meet God in the wilderness, admit that we need help to begin our path out. In fact, as human beings and with all our securities, our hang-ups, our secrets, our jealousies, our grievances, and temper, we need to turn and ask God to completely lead us, to take hold of us and lead us. When we do that, we, we let go of the reins ourselves. What are we in the wilderness about right now? Is it something in us that is unsettled? Have we received news that has left us in the dark? Is it a, a strained relationship that just doesn't have any grounding, any, any comfort? Is it a relationship that we want, but are in the wilderness about how to approach it? As Christmas draws near, there's the excitement, but sometimes there's also that tension of what it will be like. And when people get together, the strained relationships can, can be worrisome. Maybe you're dealing with a number of things through work or job-related activities or situations, hostile situations or a spiritual matter. How will this all work out? Where is your comfort? And you feel in the wilderness, perhaps, about it all. Maybe we just want to throw up our hands because we think we've tried everything. But are you ready, throwing up your hands and saying, God, take this from me, are you ready to let go of your sufficiency and be ready for dependency? To depend on God instead of on ourselves for things. We don't want to let go of things. We want to hang on. But sometimes we need to let go in order to find our way. And this may well be the point of the wilderness. As we declare, I don't know what else I can do. God, maybe that's what God is saying here to the Israelites. I was trying everything else. Jerusalem, do not listen. The crown city lies now in ruins and they're, they're under the thumb of the Babylonians. They have nothing left to offer. And God says, yes, perfect. Now they're ready. Now they're ready. I've got you exactly where I need you. The wilderness pushes back against our rugged Western individualism and reminds us that we cannot do this on our own. Self-sufficiency self dies in the wilderness. That's the power of the wilderness. Maybe, just maybe in the wilderness, the voices will be quieted. The pride will be softened and the ears opened. Maybe, just maybe, we'll be ready to hear differently in the wilderness than we could in the, the boisterous, many voices, sufficiency that we've been living in. The wilderness is a place that really makes us open up to hear and listen. In the wilderness in Egypt, in ancient times, there were people who would wander all around on the trade routes, and they would mark the wells 
by putting little cairns along the way. So to stack some rocks to encourage travelers to keep going and letting them know where the water was so they could take a drink on their way. Well, and the wells, of course, had been drilled and, and, and dug by other people along the way, but we got the benefits of, of using the water from those wells. And it's, it's part of the, the beautiful tradition of being followers of Christ. In other words, we lean on the journey that others have taken in faith before us. You know, we sort of follow in their footsteps. We trust the words of, of Scripture. We trust the words to find our way of Scripture. Apostle Paul, he said, when we're weak, we're strong. When we allow God to take over and become dependent on Him, instead of trying to be sufficient on our own, it changes everything. If we open up, if we realize what we're feeling and suppressing and trying to push aside and allow Christ to enter in, we will be like the lambs, safely nestled into the arms of the shepherd. We will find a place and receive the comfort and the strength we need. Even if we read through to the end of chapter 40, it speaks to us about this as well. And the result of declaring our wilderness, will, we shall be bound up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Strength to move forward. The New Testament speaks of, of, of Jesus coming as the Good Shepherd. Not everyone may find the image of a shepherd comforting, but we know, and as we talked about a few minutes ago, we know what the shepherd does, what the shepherd's responsibilities are to protect and to guide the flock. And that's what Christ does for us. So we turn ourselves over to God and Christ, and in so doing, we belong to God, not to ourselves. We let go and trust God to take the wheel, to take us through to the light of day and death. We let God claim us as God's own. We do not belong to ourselves any longer. And even thinking about that, I feel, I feel held, I feel, I feel covered, surrounded. Like that warm light. The comfort, comfort of which Isaiah speaks emerges straight out of the harshest realities of life in this world. Christmas and the incarnate advent of God's, God's Christ does not shoot out from a thoughtful arrangement of poinsettias or from the elegantly laid out front yard crash. The incarnation comes into our sinfulness and our wilderness so that what can emerge from all that is newness of life, hope, joy, peace of a new creation, a new way, a new day. Advent is not celebrated because the world looked like some picturesque Christmas card. Advent is here because our reality is so very often far away from all that is pretty and peaceful and just right. There is only one who leads to that restoration of, of shalom and, and to that, those tidings of comfort and joy. Make room in your wilderness and prepare the way through that for Christ to come to you, for Christ to come to you this Christmas. Let us prepare our hearts to receive him and him. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us join our voices with the angels today. Angels we have heard on the way. 38 in the grand of words are on the street.
Sunday in Advent celebrates God's gift of peace. When we look around the world, we see so many places where peace is missing. In neighborhoods, in nations. But because we know the gift of God's peace, we can trust that our gifts will help to restore true peace to souls and, and situations by the power of God's Holy Spirit. Our offerings will now be received. But may they know they're not forgotten. 
Lord, we thank you for the many activities that our pastoral charge has been doing and, and the fun and the results of all these opportunities. We thank you for the opportunities to do them and the privilege of working together and enjoying ourselves as, as your people. We pray for others at this time who we know need God's peace, God's joy, God's light in their lives. We ask, Lord, that you shine the light of your comfort into their hearts. Come to us, Christ Jesus, and bring us joy. Come, Christ Jesus, and reign, and claim your rightful place in our hearts. Our world is deeply struggling to find the justice and mercy that you call for. Draw near to our leaders and all citizens working for peace and justice, and those striving to mediate or contain conflicts or stop conflicts. Encourage honorable action and cooperation on all sides, we pray. Give hope to people under deep oppression and to those living with fear or hunger day by day by day. Hasten the day when the world's peoples will live as neighbors reconciled in your truth and freedom. We pray and hope for this day. Come to us, Christ Jesus, and bring us joy. Bring all your people joy. We offer these prayers through Christ our Lord. Amen and amen. And our hymn to, to take us forth, hymn of comfort, Gentle Mary, lay her child. 46 in the red or on the screen. <laughs>
Thank you.